I'm Eli Silver. I'm president of the Ameritai Association this year. Um, and this lecture happens twice a year, one in the fall, one in the spring. And it highlights some of the work that um, our Ameritai do in terms of research, teaching, uh, service, philanthropy. And in a recent study, it's been shown that when you look at the amount of effort that the Ameritai put in system-wide, it's like having an 11th campus at UC. So, um, so we're happy to highlight um, some of the more outstanding um, Ameritai. And tonight's lecture will be entitled Questions 27 and 28, and that is Loyalty um, and Japanese American Incarceration, which will discuss why answering these questions, which are about willingness to serve in the U.S. military and for swearing allegiance to the Japanese emperor, were confusing and divisive, and it created rifts and trauma within the incarcerated community that resonate to this day. Well, so in order to have a real proper introduction to um, the speaker tonight, I'd like to ask um, Professor Jasmine Alinda to come up and give her an introduction. She's the Dean of Humanities and Professor of History at UC Santa Cruz. Thank you. Good evening. How's everyone doing? Great. Karen Te Yamashita is Edward A. Dixon Professor Emerita of Literature, Creative Writing, and Critical Race and Ethnic Studies. She joined the Literature Department in 1997 and retired in November 2018. Some, no one in this crowd, but some might have taken a well-deserved break. But Karen Te Yamashita has kept at it, full tilt. Her writing is only outpaced by the accolades she has received. One month after her retirement, in December 2018, Professor Yamashita won the John Dos Passos Prize for Literature, a prize given to American creative writers who have produced a substantial body of significant publication that displays an intense and original exploration of specifically American themes an experimental approach to form, and an interest in a wide range of human experiences. The committee wrote that Professor Yamashita challenges our preconceptions of identity and citizenship with narratives of community that stretch across physical borders and confound social categories. Other winners of the award include Colson Whitehead and Maxine Hong Kingston. Also in 2018, Professor Yamashita was honored with a tribute by Voices of Our Nation Arts Foundation, a foundation that centers and honors the traditions and aesthetics of writers of color to provide a space for their work and learning. In 2019, Professor Yamashita, um, her brilliant novel, I Hotel, which was first published in 2010, was republished in a new edition. At its initial publication, the novel received the California Book Award Gold Medal in Fiction, as well as an American Book Award, the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association Award, and the Association for Asian American Studies Book Award. Her colleague, Mika Perks, sitting right here to my left, writes, the I Hotel is Professor Yamashita's opus. This 626 page book builds on and coalesces many of her previous obsessions, multiple perspectives, the intercessions of politics, art and culture, global flows, Yet as playful as it often is, it also is finally an angry, brilliant call to action to wake us from our restless slumber. Also in 2019, Professor Yamashita received the Association for Asian American Studies Award for Outstanding Achievement in Creative Writing, Prose, for Letters to Memory, a groundbreaking experimental work of creative nonfiction that explores her family's experience incarcerated during World War II. I myself am a scholar of photography and the incarceration of Japanese Americans and feel a special connection to this work in which Yamashita returns to her own family's archive 
from their period of incarceration, including photographs and letters, in a profound meditation on injustice, civil rights, forgiveness, and memory across generations. Her most recent work, the collection of short stories entitled Sanse and Sensibility, was heralded by critics who celebrated her er evocation of the experiences of Japanese Americans growing up in the 1960s and 1970s, while reimagining the work of Jane Austen. Sansei and Sensibility has received outstanding reviews. The Star Tribune calls it innovative and thought-provoking. The Millions writes, Yamashita reconsiders canonical works, questions cultural inheritance, and experiments with genre and form. In praising the collection, Literary Hub calls Yamashita one of America's great unsung geniuses. Unsung no longer. The National Book Foundation awarded her the 2021 Medal for Distinguished Contribution to American Letters. A bold and groundbreaking writer, Yamashita's deeply creative body of work has made an enduring impact on our literary landscape, said David Steinberger, chair of the board of directors of the National Book Foundation. Through adept crafting, passionate research, and timely narratives, Yamashita defines and redefines again and again what storytelling can do, said Ruth Dickey, executive director of the National Book Foundation. Dickey continued, in her book, she compels and challenges readers to engage with ideas, identities, and complicated words that mirror the complexity of life. Previous recipients of this award include Joan Didion, E.L. Doctorow, Ursula K. Le Guin, and Toni Morrison. Last spring, Karen and I had the chance to spend time together in Los Angeles at the event we held in her honor at the Japanese American National Museum to celebrate this achievement. So in these short years since retirement, it's clear that Professor Yamashita has only accelerated her prolific pace of publishing, and in addition, she's in high demand as a speaker. Her dance card is full, yet she continues to take on new projects. The title of her talk this evening is Questions 27 and 28, Loyalty in Japanese American Incarceration, which returns her to her family's own history. For those of us who study the Japanese American experience during World War II, the issue of loyalty is a well-worn trope which has had enduring consequences. The military architects of the incarceration had fought to have all Japanese Americans incarcerated precisely because they argued in racist terms that loyalty was impossible to determine. Far from a proper and legal form of due process, the leave clearance questionnaire, which contained those two questions, was confusing, divisive, and tore at the fabric of already disrupted lives and families. It attempted to reinforce the artificial categories of loyal and disloyal. Those two key questions became a kind of failed litmus test, whose terms many Japanese Americans at the time refused. Many qualified their responses, yes and no, maybe, if. 12% of Nisei said either no or qualified their responses when asked to forswear allegiance to Japan and pledge loyalty to the United States. Bill Manbo, an auto mechanic, and Nisei from Hollywood, who was incarcerated in Heart Mountain, Wyoming, and took some incredible color photographs while imprisoned, did not say yes or no. He said if, as in, if we get our rights back. There was power and agency in if, in maybe, in giving conditions, in setting one's terms. Dissent takes on many forms. We're only beginning to understand the permutations and gradations of dissent in response to questions 27 and 28. Karen Teyamashita's contribution to this history will no doubt be a revelation and speak to its continued resonance. Every day as Dean of Humanities at UCSC, I get to feel both humbled and honored by the incredible work of my colleagues in the Humanities Division. Standing before you now, I feel that most intensely as we welcome the brilliant Karen Teyamashita to the podium. Oh, um, 
Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you so much. Let's see if I can read this. Well, well maybe I can't. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, all of you. Thank you um, to the UC Santa Cruz Emeriti Association, to Barry Bowman, who invited me originally. Hello. Hi. And uh, to Eli Silva, Silver, um, to Judith Eisen. Is Judith here? I don't know. Hello, <laughs> and to Christy Dolly, thank you all of you for, for um, helping me to be here, you know, technically and also um, physically. C can I pull this down a little? Yeah, it's in my way. Um, and thank you to friends and colleagues uh, and students, and especially all you retired people. <laughs> Retirement is great. <laughs> Um, I also want to thank the Emeriti Association for granting me the Edward A. Dixon Emeritus Professorship Award, and I'm pleased tonight to share the writing and research um, that your generous gift has made possible. Let's see here. Oh, I want to touch the screen. Okay, so it goes this way, right? So before I launch into this talk, I'd like to ask all of you to answer these questions. So uh, by a show of hands, are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the United States on combat duty wherever ordered? How many say yes? I got one. Okay. How many say no? Oh, my God. Goodness. All right, so the person who said yes, can you tell me why you said yes? And how about somebody who said no? Tell me why you said no. Yes. Uh, when I was young enough to go into the service, it was the Vietnam War. And um, that I refused to go in. Uh, fortunately, there was uh, an academic uh, buyout. And so by the time I was finished with academics, I was too old. But had they called me up at that time, I would not have gone. You would have gone to Canada, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. OK, how about question B? Will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America and faithfully defend the United States from any or all attack by foreign or domestic forces and forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to any other foreign government, power, or organization. How many say yes? Okay. And how many say no? Wow. Huh. Okay, so, so tell me why yes. Anybody? Who said yes? All right. Hey. I can't, think of I can't think of any other country I would swear allegiance to. This is my home. Mm -hmm. uh, my ancestors have been here since second voyage of the Mayflower. Okay. We, we are Americans. Yes. And how about the no's? Someone would. Well, um, today's election day. <laughs> and uh, it's quite possible that p we might end up with representation that doesn't feel very representative. Um, so that's one thing I can't imagine. There's being certain directions the government would go in that I would follow obediently. But secondly, um, my family is international. I have multiple countries of loyalties and commitments within my extended family. All right. So we've got a mixed crowd. 
And I think a lot of you would go on to Tule Lakes and you would be sent to the segregation center there. <laughs> um, okay, so let's, let's go forward here. So my talk today will be from two chapters recently penned from my new book project entitled Questions 27 and 28. And as you know, Japanese Americans living on the Pacific coast were forcibly incarcerated during World War II as they were considered enemy aliens, or in the case of my parents, who were American-born citizens, enemy non-aliens. In 1943, a year after having imprisoned 120,000 people, the War Relocation Authority had the problem of sorting out who to release from camp, who were eligible to join the military to fight the war, and who could leave to continue their normal lives from, uh, distant from the West Coast. So to find out, the government issued a questionnaire and statement to be signed by each individual. And the two defining questions were these. Um, are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the United States on combat duty wherever ordered? And will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America? And different from what I had asked you, um, and forswear um, any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese emperor or any other foreign government power organization. So to answer these questions under the duress of imprisonment, the loss of rights as American citizens and considering intergenerational differences was not simple. Individual answers to these questions divided families, friendships, and entire communities, creating rifts and intense antagonism that resonate through the Japanese American community to this day. So today I'd like to read from two chapters in this project, and the chapters are named after women, Violet and Haruko. Violet, War Hysteria. Now this uh, story, the story in this chapter focuses on the relationship between two women, Violet and Rosalie. In 1943, Violet Matsuda was 26 year old, uh, was a 26 year old Japanese American mother with three children incarcerated at the Tule Lake segregation camp in Northern California. In the same year, also at Tule Lake, Rosalie Hankey was a 30-year-old undergraduate at Cal Berkeley, working as a researcher for the Japanese Evacuation and Resettlement Study directed by Dorothy Swain Thomas, professor of sociology. In later life, Violet became a poet and translator of haiku, and Rosalie became a professor of anthropology. At the end of their lives, Violet accused Rosalie of violating the ethical boundaries of her research at Tule Lake in 1943, which outed Violet as a radical pro-Japanese agitator and enforced the renunciation of her American citizenship. So in my reading tonight, I will only read the sections from Rosalie's point of view. And a small caveat, these narratives are interior to Rosalie's mind. However, they are expressed in the third person as if exterior to herself. Violet, War Hysteria. Rosalie says, Joe said I should come visit you. She thinks that lady hefts that kid like she could throw it at her. If she threw it, would she bother to catch it? mothers and their babies as if having them made them better, made them women. Certainly not smarter. She doesn't know she's on her side. What side is that? She'll have to find out. Rosalie shifts, scuffing the sandy soil under her boots and tries to decide on the correct attitude that would give her access to the room inside. Coyness might work with a man, but this woman might find it suspect, might see through her ploy. A mixture of ingratiating stupidity, requesting proper instruction, this might work. 
try her meager Japanese to show her honest and humble attempt, stumble with the bad words like inu and ketto, just to get a small rise or a knowing wink. An insider who can be trusted, oh, that's right, she can pretend to care about the baby, about those poor children. How old is that baby anyway? Scrawny thing looks sick. How awkward this maternal business. It's easier to ply the men for information, play the geisha game of wit and female intelligence, the drinking sport. She can hold her liquor cup for cup, tit for tat, get the tongues to loosen, dangle, negotiating danger. Yes, it's dangerous. She craves danger, the war out there, the war in here. Joe says, be careful. After they stab public Inu number one, the next victim will be white. Untangling the tangle of hostilities and intrigue like a game of chess, anticipating the falling pieces. Sipping tea with the women is tiresome and petty, but this woman doesn't just seem to be any gossip. What a miserable household. How many times has she been displaced? Meager belongings shed each time until there is only this sparse room. To lose everything except her pride, and nonetheless, spotless, the sign of a woman's world in control. So like her own mother, Joe says, don't be fooled, she's harder than nails, like that Chinese madam, what's her name? Chang Gai Shek. Oh, that's her. She code names her Mrs. Q. Her husband is the leader of the radical resegregationists, and she's not say, shy to say it. The fence sitters need to commit to renunciation or leave. That's the only way we will have peace in this camp. We came here to be with others like ourselves, prepared to return to Japan. She must go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the madam. She reads her, bossy, defiant, uncompliant, an opponent to keep on her side. This requires more finesse. She admits it. She's unpleasant, and she already dislikes her, but that should not matter. Rosalie steps from her barrack room toward the toilets. She's tipsy from bootleg sake, a song limerick tw twirling in her head. She doesn't see the upturned spout of the oil can before it runs like a dagger into her calf. She limps into the hospital, blood running over her shoes. When she sees Dr. Noguchi, her stomach clenches. Word is he hates Keto. It's the recurring story in Thule. The doctor declares no, no, disloyal, but his son-in-law declares yes. His grandson, a boy of nine, stands between. With no rights in this country, the boy he's raised from birth is turned over to the citizen father. By the doctor's standards, a good-for-nothing Nisei who took off when his daughter dies in childbirth. Every day he remembers his lost grandson. Every day his bitterness concentrates into the tincture of hate. She scoots onto the operating table, pulls back her skirt, exposing the bloody gash, the soft knoll of her knee and white thigh. The doctor peers over his spectacles at the leg with academic interest, then tugs her skirt back down over the bloody mess, remarking curtly, it will wash. As if in answer, the nurse steps forward and brushes a wash of iodine over the cut. She thinks about her conversation with the young Satoichi. Certainly he is boasting, 200 seinen, 10 of whom pledge to die under his command, ready to attack a dozen listed inu. Such an uprising will bring in the army and settle once and for all all the segregation of true Japanese from the weak, fence-sitters fence and undecided. The plans are in place. He only waits the signal. Pulled out of San Francisco State and thrown into camp, 
he makes up his mind. Renunciate, become a full-blooded Japanese, speak Japanese, think Japanese, act Japanese. She takes her royal portable to his barrack, copies everything, his minutes from their secret meetings, his pledge to the hunger strike, his personal diary filled with obscenities. She types, interspersing their conversations with denunciations of British imperialism and lessons in Bushido. He admires her bravery in slipping by the administration to record their resistance. Because of her writing, when the time comes, Japan will know the courage of their convictions. She must not worry. He will protect her. Where is Satoichi now? The doctor takes a thick needle and jabs her wounded skin. The nurse flinches, but she holds steady the doctor's eyes. The Japanese, she reminds herself, have contempt for cowardice. She risks the loss of herself to become Japanese, a necessary risk in order to merge into, to become invisible. Secretly, she despises the nurse who flinches. She thinks an understanding passes between the doctor and herself. At the news of the death of public Inu, number one, she feels what he feels, that the conspiring Inu who steals from the co-op coffers gets what he deserves, a knife to his throat. The doctor tugs at the needle, but it doesn't give. He, asked, he asks, does it pain? She replies, no, and in fact, she feels nothing. She remembers that Satoichi confesses he does not love his wife. He prefers strong, spirited women like her, not meek and docile. She thinks about Mrs. Q. Would he prefer Mrs. Q? The doctor motions to the nurse, who threads a proper needle. The doctor begins to stitch the cut, drawing together torn skin. The resegregationists seem to be splitting into factions, each with their dedicated young henchmen. She consults Satoichi, who shaves his head to distinguish his position. Bald head versus long hairs, bozu versus yogore, dainippon tai... Te koku banzai Satoichi, hairless, appears stalwart, his earnest face now naked, unmasked. To this vulnerable face, she validates her reading of the edicts of Bushido. She says, the samurai code of ethics requires sacrifice. She thinks Japanese understand oblique references. But what has Bushido got to do with love? The doctor grabs the stubborn needle with pliers and yanks it out. In fact, the needle has achieved a kind of numbness in the area. Does it pain? The doctor asks again. She feels nothing. Stoically, stoically she stands properly. She thanks the doctor, bows, and takes her leave. Rosalie parts the curtains only slightly and peers into the street. The car is still there, parked in front of her house. She knows the news, sees it on CBS on August 10th, 1988. The president flanked by all those nicely dressed Nisei signing the redress. That is several weeks ago. She sees the rounded bubble of the woman's white hair, hands gripping the steering wheel, eyes staring into the shaded street. She's driven from D.C. to St. Louis, maybe 800 miles, two days perhaps, maybe three, but she's in her 70s, driving alone across the country. When she is 70, she can do it, but not now. Old age comes faster these days. Murray's gone, but he checks in. He feels guilty, as he should. He did that video interview of her to set things straight. Little good it will do if that woman is still out there in her car. If she calls Murray, he'll come over and shoo the lady away, confront her with her lies and accusations. It's true. Mrs. Q is M Mrs. Tsuchikawa, is Hyacinth, is Kazu, is Violet, the woman in the car. Her field notes don't lie. 
She writes, ardent lady segregationist. She can't say she is just a record keeper, not even a student researcher taking notes so that the truth can be known as history when history makes the government accountable 46 years later. Nor is she recording the right actions of Japanese nationalists. She holds no opinions about who is right or wrong, who is loyal or disloyal. Trust is a sympathetic, unprejudiced ear. The reports are made, the story is told. Only she is there to know it. Too naive, too immature to understand, she is the future. She risks becoming Japanese to know, risks becoming German. The most alive time in her life when every moment matters, when the consequences are life and death. Joe writes to her in August 1945, after the bombing, to speak of his horror and anger. She cannot respond. There are no words. 20,000 will never pay off that woman. What the government did to her and to her people can never be repaid. She steps away from the window. The sheer curtains hide her crooked silhouette. She places her hands on unsteady thighs and bows deeply. And these epigrams. It is not important whether or not the interpretation is correct. If men define their situations as real, they are real in their consequences. The Child in America, W.I. Thomas and Dorothy Swain Thomas, 1928. Onna wa otoku yori isogashiku zatsuzen shito suma kaki tsubata. Women are busier than men, people living in disarray, and there are irises. The other chapter from this project I want to share for, with you today is Haruko, Mother Earth. Perhaps you recognize this painting by the artist Chiura Obata. It hangs in the de Young Museum in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. Obata immigrated to the United States in 1903, working at various jobs while pursuing his art. Eventually, he taught art at Cal Berkeley. In 1942, he was imprisoned with his family at Tamferan Assembly Center in San Bruno, and then in the Topaz concentration camp in Delta, Utah, where he founded an art school. Chiura Bata met and married Haruko Kohashi in San Francisco in 1912. And while Chiura's story is well known, as is often the case with the stories of women, Haruko's story remains behind the scenes. Chiura's art was sumie painting, and Haruko's art was in the cultivation of arranging flowers. So to begin, Haruko, Mother Earth. Murakami-sensei was an old man, perhaps maybe older than Papa when he died. It was summertime, warm air, sticky and slow. It's hard to believe I could only be 10 and sit so quietly. He put three leaves of baran okame in my hands. Baran grow simply from moist soil in leafy bunches, ornamental leaves, not flowers, not so special, you would think. But these narrow, elliptical leaves had white stripes moving through dark green, each the same and yet different. I felt the glossy smoothness and the soft veins flowing from stem to tip, front side and underside, the delicate strength and peculiar curve of each leaf. This one longer, this shorter, thicker here, paper thin here. Stand the tallest leaf upward to heaven. The mid-sized leaf to one side as man, and the shortest to the other side nearest earth. 
a triangle of life. But take care. Turn this leaf to face forward, but to which direction the others? And their white stripes, how do their patterns flow? How would you come upon these leaves in a shaded grove, dappled in sunlight, wet with rain? This was my first lesson. Heaven. Do you see that beautiful woman in the painting? That is me. I came with my father to San Francisco in 1910 to live at the Nagasakiya. This was a boarding house for Japanese run by my aunt on Geary Street. My aunt wanted me to work at the house, but I refused. I told her I'd come to America to learn to sew. I might have said that I came to America to be free, free of tight kimonos, but what did I really know? I was 18 years old. In those days, I might have been the only single Japanese woman in all of San Francisco. News travels. Men came to the boarding house to check me out, followed me on the street. What a nuisance. Every month, there was another marriage proposal. Oh, well, that's true. Finally, I married Papa. He made a proposal to my father, said his plan was to study in Europe, then return to Japan. I wanted to go to Europe, so I said yes. <laughs> to this day, I have never been to Europe. <laughs> we got married at Ogawate, a restaurant on California and Grant. This was just after the New Year in 1912. We had a difficult time finding a place to live. First, we rented an apartment on Bush Street outside of Nihomachi. I cleaned it sparkling and made a vegetable and flower garden in the yard, but just when my seeds were sprout sprouting, we were evicted. Papa and I packed everything in a big truck with nowhere to go. Papa said, let's have lunch to cheer me up. My stomach wasn't feeling so good, but anyway, we went to eat. Sakai-san was there at the restaurant, too, and asked about the truck in front. That's how we moved into a room in the back of the Ooki fish store on post. It was a room where the employees went for breaks and naps. Very cramped, smell of fish. During the day, I took care of Shizu. Sakai-san's baby daughter. That, this was temporary. Next, we moved into an apartment down the same street. Same thing, I cleaned it up and we were evicted again. So much discrimination. Finally, Papa found a house on Sutter for 35 a month. Too expensive, I thought, but Papa rented an extra room to others, a koto teacher, a painter, and a shop worker. Their rent paid for everything. Papa chose a big room for his studio with a smaller room next to it for our bedroom. That first year of our marriage in March, I thought maybe I was pregnant. But in April, I was sure. So I told Papa. He said, well, this is going to be a problem. Get undressed right now. Women lose their shape after they get pregnant. I need to paint you before you lose your shape. <laughs> lose my shape? Look at me now. Four children, first Kimio, then Fujiko, then Gyo, then Yuri. Have I lost my shape? Well, of course I have. But what sort of response is that? That is what it was to marry an artist. But Papa was resourceful and smart to use his talent to support our family, drawing for books and magazines, making the backdrop for window scenes at Gump's. Even the grand scenes of opera, Madama Butterfly, well, in my opinion, a silly story, but never before did they have such authentic scenes. And at every chance, he took us all away to places where the children could play and he could paint and draw. For many summers, we stayed in a farm in Santa Cruz in the redwood forest with trips to the beach. You know the scenes Papa painted, 
all famous not, now, like Hiroshige in California. You see the ancient redwoods, their branches bending to earth, the twilight softening and making that misty glow, wispy fog in the warm air around the pure blackness of the hair. One night, the farmer at the house in Santa Cruz began to cough blood, and Papa ran through the dark woods to find help. He thought, my friend is dying. His spirit guides me by moonlight. See where he paints wet on wet, his hand guiding three different brushes to make that glow precisely, deftly, with each breath. He cannot make any mistakes. My son Kimio inside of me then must have known our arguments. What was Papa going to do with his naked paintings of me? He argued, all wives of artists pose nude. Nude, as if this was my duty. Scandalous, how embarrassing. I would not become a spectacle in public. Over many days, we argued and argued. I refused, he pleaded. I will make a painting to preserve your beauty. Such nonsense. One day we got a letter to say that Rokuichi had died. He was both Papa's brother and father. This is the complication of Yoshi practice in Japan. A family's name must continue with its property and legacy. So Rokuichi married into a family in Sendai and took their name, then took his younger brother to be his adopted son. The story is that Rokuichi practically captured his little brother, and Papa went screaming and crying from his birth mom, mother and home in Okayama. Who is to say where and from whom we come? Papa is known by his name and it will always be so. When Rokuichi died, Papa decided we must all go to Japan. Kimio, Fujiko, Gyo, Yuri, me. Papa painted, showed his work, oversaw a series of woodcuts in his California scenes. He wanted to show California as he saw it. Kimio missed his friends and left early to return to high school in San Francisco. Papa, who had run away from his home himself, thought this was best. The rest of us learned to live in Japan, but it was not forever. After two years and before we left Japan, I took Fujiko to my mother's home in Fukuoka. Maybe Fujiko, even at 13, with a child's mind, so sweet, and innocent, understood, understood, or perhaps not. I placed three Haran Okama in her hands, embraced her for one last time, and turned away. I could not show my tears and heartbreak. When I was a good distance from the house, I could finally look back without showing my distress. I saw Fujiko sitting, facing the garden, her legs dangling over the wooden deck, extending from our old house, twirling those leaves. Papa said, no one will see this painting, but I must paint it. Papa made a big easel for his sketches. He unwrapped a special piece of silk woven from the first spring threads of the finest silkworms. He stretched this precious silk over a giant frame that almost filled our room. He dissolved a special glue made from deer hide, carefully simmering it in water, then straining it through a fine gauze to remove all impurities. Into this niku wasui, he added finely ground hydrated alum. This solution, this dosa, with a thin flat brush, he then spread tenderly over the silk surface. He prepared the paints, got oyster shells from Uoki, smashed and ground them into a fine white paint. This, he said, to paint your soft skin. He separated his best sumi and sent for special colors from Japan. 
This was paint made from stones like lapis lazuli or crystal agate, also coral and flowers. Finally, he prepared his special brushes made from the hair of deer, rabbit, badger, bear, fox, and cat. He placed the silk frame with its empty white surface on the floor and readied three brushes in his hand like chopsticks. Nothing more to argue. Every night, we close the windows, the curtains, close the doors, many nights. Man. Papa painted this scene after he left the hospital in Salt Lake. It was when we stayed at Larry and Guyo's house for a few weeks until we left for St. Louis. Before that, Papa had no paints or brushes, and the doctors strictly advised him not to work. But it was impossible to prohibit him from drawing. As soon as he had a pencil or pen or paper, he was always sketching. We thought we could stay in Salt Lake, but there were no jobs for Papa there. Larry and Guyo were reporters, so they wanted to know what happened. Perhaps it's not fair to say so, but if you did not live in camp, you cannot really know how it felt. Larry and Guyo might not understand. If they wrote anything, it could be interpreted in different ways. Papa listened to our conversation and painted. Meanwhile, I rubbed the sumi stick on stone and into ink. This was often my job, prepare the ink just so. Pass Papa the correct brush, wash the brush, the next brush, how many public demonstrations, in proper kimono for the show, I was Papa's assistant, like an operating nurse. If you think about it, half of those paintings are also my work. No ink, no painting. Papa could see something and never forget. Never forget a face or flower, its shape and color. He came close to losing his sight and losing his painting arm and hand. This would have been like death to him. What he saw the night he was attacked, he would never draw or record. The truth of what one sees and what one draws might not be the same. Do you not notice that he rarely painted portraits of anyone. He drew what we all experienced in camp together because we had no other way to record what happened. But after we left camp, Papa was even more dedicated to the faces of nature. He thought that art in nature could save us. He was an, an idealist. When we arrived at Tamperan in that cold, smelly horse stall, I cried and cried. What did we do to deserve this dirty prison? We had a pretty house with a well-supplied kitchen, our garden with vegetables and fruit trees, so lovely. Papa's work at the university, our art supply shop, now with a bullet hole through the window, my flower arranging classes, all Papa's paintings, everything left behind, one suitcase. But Papa drew our hopeless and sad surroundings and still found hope. That was his purpose. Papa said it was the questionnaire. It forced people to take sides. What side are you on? Were you the enemy? Could you be trusted? What did this mean? Good people were loyal on both sides. Good people were spoiled by evil events. Even today, no one wants to talk about what happened. They feel ashamed. But what do we have to be ashamed of? We did not do anything wrong. We were wronged. Papa looked at my strained fig fingers, rubbing the sumi stick as if to draw blood, and said, that's enough. The man who followed Papa from the bathhouse in the dark and even put on, had even put on a kind of uniform, a military cap. He had already taken sides, and he believed Papa was a traitor. Poor Papa, an 
idealistic artists accepting painting supplies from Hagujin friends outside of camp, organizing the artists to make an art school in camp. What did this man think at a time like this, accepting our cruel circumstances with painting lessons? He must have thought it absurd. Which side was Papa on? The man's suspicions and anger must have overwhelmed all his senses. His weapon was a metal pipe. Konoyaro, he yelled, and plunged the pipe into Papa's head. Papa held his left arm to up to protect his right. He could not lose his painting arm. The man hit him again and again. Papa threw off his geta to get away, running around the block five. I could hear shouting in the distance. Papa, blinded, grabbed a fistful of sand and threw it at the man who screamed and retreated. Reaching our barrack, he was soaked in blood. I wrapped his head in a towel. Lock the door, he commanded, stay here. Our block was in the first row of barracks across from the hospital, but it was a good distance over dirt roads. I peeked through the window to see Papa limping away and realized that he was barefoot. His forehead and brows were stitched together, his corona damaged. How, the doctor asked, was his left arm not broken, his head not crushed? Every day people came to see Papa at the hospital, all the artists who taught at our school, all the students, Papa's friends, the newlyweds from the wedding party, where Papa had come from that night before his bath. Papa worried about the art school. Matsusaburo and Hisako told him not to worry, they would carry on. Did Papa know we already had 600 students, so many from the first few children who came to our door that cold, rainy night? People heard rumors we were tossed back and forth between the banality of everyday surviving and anxious fear. If this happened to Papa, it could happen to others. Who could we trust? Then seven days later, a man walking his dog at the far end of camp was shot by an MP from the tower lookout. The MP said he shouted for warnings that the man had crossed the barbed wire Perhaps the dog had run under the wire, but the, do the man could not. And they said the man was hard of hearing. He fell to his death inside the barbed wire. The guns were pointed at us. Horror and anger intensified. 2,000 people went to the funeral in protest. Three days later, the camp director came to tell us that given the rumors, he could not guarantee Papa's safety. And in any case, he should be seen by doctors in Salt Lake City. In the dark of night, Papa was removed from camp and driven away. Larry said that Papa should speak out. Others had been attacked in other camps, and it was time these guys were punished and separated. True, the FBI had come to visit Papa, but he remained silent. It was midnight. Who could see in the dark? Papa shook his head and painted the dying man at the barbed wire falling next to the, his dog. Papa said, I am alive. You cannot make me a martyr for your cause. I watched Papa's careful strokes on paper. Mama, he asked, what was the date? I knew the day that Papa was attacked and counted seven more days. April 11th, I said. Papa nodded and wrote down that date. This was the last record of events at camp that Papa drew. Of course, he did not, we did not know personally the man who was killed, except for his name, Hatsuki. But Papa could not just draw any face. His hand could reveal the smallest but special details that marked recognition. And so, in this painting, I saw 
that he drew his own face. Earth. Probably the tower is much too tall, but Papa could envision it at the center, the barbed wire fence at the bottom, the barracks and distant mountains beyond. Clouds and moon above, yes, always the moon, no matter where we might be, in Yosemite or Topaz, everything wrapping around the book. Dorothy sent with her father, with her letter, a postcard photo to show Papa, but he only glanced at it. He made a pencil sketch. He picked up a book of haiku that Asano-san had left on in the morning and folded this sketch around it to demonstrate. The title can go here, here the author name, here in the spine title and name. And then Papa took a large piece of paper and began to draw. If Dorothy were there, she would have watched in surprise. It was only a suggestion in her letter that Papa could draw the cover for her book. The book was a proposal or perhaps a promise. She, her students, and many collaborators were researching this work as it was happening. Now I understand that we were her research. Did Dorothy know that just by writing to Papa, that he and the Japanese who helped her research, that we became targets of suspicion? All those questions, like the questionnaire, all this seemed like prying and spying. What would the government do with our answers? How could we trust the questioners to make sense of our answers? How many of us pretended or simply lied, said things to make them feel better, entertain their ideas to make them go away? Probably Dorothy did not expect him to draw this book cover for her, but Papa needed to work to feel useful. He did not care about being under suspicion. He could not draw to record everything that happened in camp. And he believed that Dorothy might be able to tell our story so that we would not be forgotten. One day before, Nick came to see Papa and me. He brought two branches of flowering apricot and a bouquet of yellow daisies. Only Nick, the town undertaker, had any flowers. In this place, you had to die to see flowers. When we arrived, we looked around, and it all seemed that nothing could grow in that silty soil except greasewood and weeds. They say we were at the bottom of an ancient lake, all dried up. Yet beauty could come from this desert. In a wood pile, I found a beautiful piece of dead juniper wood. I asked Papa to cut a piece. I made a hammer with a stick and nail, and every night chipped a hole out of the center, little by little. Someone set us, sent us a box of walnuts. I crushed the shells to, expo to expel the oil and wrapped them in an old cloth to polish this face. When I, then I looked for flowers. My Ikebana students in Berkeley sent us books and special materials like Matagi and Tomegi and Kenzan, and the best surprise, Camellia branches. Then I opened the boxes. I felt my heart swell, then saddened to see branches without flowers. But Yuri pulled away a piece of colored tissue paper, cushioning everything. Yes, of course. We began to work with the paper to make flowers. Each petal with a little glue, and the branches were in bloom, Nick was impressed by our camellias. From afar, you could believe they were real. I taught him something about Ikebana, and he understood. Nick helped Papa to go into the hills to find plants and soil to bring back to camp. Papa and others found an old twisted pine tree, dug it up, and planted it in front of our barrack. They went back with a dump truck and got a load of rocks and stones. We had to create gravel walk paths to keep from sinking into the clay silt and turning that turned into slimy mud in the rain. You can imagine us like catfish swimming in sludge. Papa made a fine garden at our place, block five, barrack 9D. Mrs. Hibino, who lived next door, and I planted flowers 
but they did not survive. We planted geraniums in pots and later bulbs. Some don't like geraniums. They say they stink. But Nick said his wife had lots and they would grow with bright color. Tulips and daffodils arrived in April, just as we were leaving. Papa sat at the visitor's chair at a small table, drawing Dorothy's book cover. Papa's head was bandaged, and he worked with one eye only, hand steady, each line straight, precise. He would prove that he had not lost his skill. First, he penned the tall tower and the armed soldiers at the barbed wire, and beyond our barracks appeared, as if floating among mountains and clouds, a sleeping village in the distance. Perhaps he remembered the last night he walked there. These images were impressed in his mind and in our dreams, never forgotten. All around was the quiet commotion of the hospital, several beds of convalescing men, sleeping, reading, staring into space, attended by nurses and aides. I arranged a vase of flowers on the nightstand next to Papa's bed. Every few days, I changed the arrangement. I placed the ap apricot branches in heaven, the geraniums for men, the daisies on earth. Papa's work will last forever. My work must disappear. And thank you to these folks for research and critical comments. Um, and special thanks to Kimi Hill and the Obata family for their permission to share the paintings and photographs of the Chirura and uh, Haruko Obata archive. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, there will be time for questions um, right now. Uh, this talk is being recorded and will be available on the Emeriti website. Um, so if anyone has questions, Barry. How did you come to know them? Um, yeah, the, the Obata family, uh, they're friends of both sides of my family, uh, my mother's side of the family and also my father's. Uh, they lived in Nihomachi, and I mentioned the Sakai Woki um, store uh, because my cousin's right here. So he, <laughs> he, he grew up in that store. <laughs> um, and uh, my, f my grandmother, she's also in one of the photographs here. She, um, she, took, she joined the art school uh, at Topaz and uh, learned to paint Sumia uh, while at camp. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, Karen. Hi, Karen. One can't help but wonder what about questions one through 26 um, or, or, you know, 28 and following. Um, yes. That those questions were in that, you know, they aren't at the beginning. They're, I don't know if they're at the end, but I'd like to know about how they're, they articulate with the rest of whatever those questions might have been that people were compelled to answer or... and. Um, and, and there, there, it wasn't that, you know, you had to answer yes or no, where there wasn't a, you tick a box, or do you, uh, how, how did... Uh, so the questions were, you know, where you live, your address, those sort of things, of course. And then there were um, where you went to school, if you had ever been to Japan, uh, if you had been to Japan for how long and when, 
Um, then, then there was an interesting question about what, what magazines did you subscribe to? And uh, Jane told what were the ladies' home journals? People would answer, things like that. Um, how well do you speak Japanese, or if you could speak Japanese? Um, uh, where you went to school? If you, if you attended Japanese school? So they were, you know, they were trying to figure out how Japanese you might be, right? Um, so those, so all the questions were rather banal, really, except for these two. Uh, and then they could have, this questionnaire, sh if actually should have been given to people before, um, if, if at all. But since they were incarcerated, then it changed the nature of this, the questions entirely. Oh, that's right. Um, so I, one of the pieces I started with was uh, a work about Isamu no Gucci. Do you know the artist Isamu no Gucci and his sculptor? Um, and what had interested me was that Noguchi did not have to go to camp. He lived in um, New York. Uh, but he had this understanding at some point that he was Nisei, second generation, and he felt compelled to um, be a part of it. So he actually volunteered to go to Poston, which was an internment camp in Arizona. Um, but he had uh, an idealistic idea about what he would be doing there. Um, you see here how um, Shiro Obata started an art school with his wife and all the artists who came. Um, similarly, uh, Isamu Noguchi had an idea that he would start an art school, but he also had some sort of idealistic ideas about um, creating a new life in the desert. Um, and I, all, I thought this was, well, you know, I'm me, Karen Yamashita, is amusing. <laughs> um, uh, ironic. And so I, I went to look up, you know, that. So I, that was sort of the centerpiece of the stories that I wrote. And then I sort of moved out from there. And the first, I, then I decided I should r really write about the Issei generation. So the first section in the book, which I've pretty much finished, are um, about Issei lives, the first generation lives. So, it, and they begin with um, Yona Noguchi, who was Isamu Noguchi's father, and came um, before the turn of the century and came to San Francisco and lived with the Bohemian um, uh, po poetry uh, um, folks in, in San Francisco in those years. So I, I was interested in him. And, and also he was gay. I mean, he was always bisexual. So uh, it was an interesting story about him. Yeah. So that, that's, I can talk all night about <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes? We have a question from online. Great. This is from Jennifer Gonzalez. And she says, wonderful, beautiful talk. Thank you so much for this poetic connection between image and text. I wonder if you can speak about how the art images shaped, inspired, or affected your thoughts about the prose. Well, in, in the piece that I did on Haruko, I spent some time taking a look at uh, Obata's work, but also I was really interested in um, her books about uh, teaching Ikebana. And so I wanted to know you know, she, she, she gave lessons in um, uh, the art of flower arranging. So, so, that, so if you notice, the, that piece is divided by her idea of how to arrange uh, flowers, that triangulation of uh, heaven, man, and earth. And so then I... I I created, well, that was my uh, structure for that piece. Um, the Violet story uh, 
does not, it's not inspired by art. It's inspired by the lives of these people. And I spent a great deal of time taking a look at um, the women uh, who were involved uh, in, in, in that story. There, there are other women, but also um, uh, Violet's mother, who uh, remains in Hiroshima and is, you know, practically dead when uh, Violet come, goes back to see her. Um, also, her mother-in-law, who dies in camp. So I, I tell the story um, through the, these women. Uh, in the story, so the what you missed, I only told you part of that story. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So when writing about these real people that actually lived, how do you balance between working from the notes and the interviews versus stylizing as a creative writer? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I spent a great deal of time <clears throat> researching the history and because I, I want to know really what happened. But what I always find out is that there's so much you don't know. So, and the people aren't here to talk about it. So I really go to look at as, as much, you know, archival material as possible. Um, and then I want to connect the dots and see what possibly might have happened. Um, yeah. But, you know, I'm a bad person. I'm, I write fiction. So <laughs> I admit it. I <laughs> and it might not be true. Yeah. Well, it's not. Um, but I worked... Uh, that story in particular about Haruko, I spent a great deal of time talking with Kimi Hill, um, and she knew her grandmother very well. And I, I could sense that she wanted her grandmother's story told. So I wanted to, I wanted to honor her with that, that, that sense that I had about that. And when I took on that voice, I wanted to know more about her grandmother. And I had her read it, and she critiqued it, and she made me take things out. You know, she said, no, I don't think this happened. I think that, you know, this possibly. But she was, she and her sister, they gave their blessing. So I feel okay with it. But, um, and also, uh, I had this feeling um, from listening to the uh, interview that uh, her mother did of, of this, her grandmother, Haruko, that there's just this, um, yeah, she, she had a, this character. She was funny and kind of, yeah, spark, you know, she just, yeah, that, I don't want to get that, but I don't know, maybe I didn't. <laughs> so you have another question from Zoom? Yeah, so from online, Valerie writes, beautiful prose, very moving. I am a high school teacher in Madeira, and right now my students are learning about Japanese internment and taking on the lens of a local family who were in Jerome. Do you have any advice for my students as they write historical narratives from this perspective? <laughs> advice? Big question. <laughs> uh, do your best. Yeah, um, and and keep keep yeah keep keep looking at keep researching. I mean, it, there's there's so much hidden material, and if you can find people to, with whom to talk, um, yeah. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Um, maybe this is too much of a spoiler, but I find myself fascinated by the Rosalie and Violet story, and I don't know if you could maybe tell us just a little bit more about uh, the two of them. Um, uh, well, so what happened in camp was that um, 
Rosalie was a, a young researcher. She'd never done this work at all. And um, I, I don't think she had any um, training, although maybe there wasn't such a thing at the time. People didn't know how to do these, um, this research um, and to do this ethnography in camp. And uh, she just learned on her own. She got, and she did it. I think she did um, the best she could in, under those circumstances. And, uh, and also, she was the person left to do it because all the, um, the Japanese who were part of the project, they became suspect and they became targets of um, harassment or abuse or possibly they would be beat up. So they left camp. And so she was left to, to find out the material, to, to research this material. Um, in the meantime, so all of her notes were taken by Dorothy Swain Thomas and Richard Nishimoto, who brought the, the, the story together and wrote the book, The Spoilage. There were two books that were written, one Spoilage and one The Salvage. The Spoilage was um, a book about Tule Lake, really, and about the people who um, were no-no and who renunciated um, their citizenship or repatriated uh, back to Japan. Um, and um, Violet was married to, married to a, a man who was a leader of the um, no-no group, resegregationists in this case, and um, she was befriended, befriended by um, Rosalie in order for Rosalie to get information. It wasn't that Rosalie didn't, or uh, Violet didn't know that she was giving this information, but she didn't know why or how it was going to be used. And um, years later, when uh, Violet returned to the United States, she read The Spoilage, and she recognized herself in that book, um, despite the fact that it's hidden under a fake name. Um, and uh, then she went to research more, and she felt that um, she felt that she had been befriended, and that this uh, Rosalie was her friend, and she felt really betrayed by this um, representation of herself, uh, and so she didn't. And so she accused Rosalie of um, uh, an ethical, uh, yeah. And, the, and, and pursue this uh, pretty um, rigorously in the last years of her life. So, uh, and in fact, she drove to uh, Rosalie's house, never really confronted her, but apparently was parked in front of her house. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, so I wanted to know what that story was all about uh, on both sides, and I wanted to understand uh, the uses of anthropology, um, but also, yeah. So I was fascinated with the story. Mm, and I, mm, I, I think I'm, be, I'm fair about what I finally did. Uh, I, I believe both women were, um, they're very strong women, and that they, um, they face difficult times, uh, and uh, both learn from what happened. Yeah. Hi, thanks so much, Karen. I can't, I can't wait to read this book, and I, I feel like um, I'm just very grateful that stories keep coming out, and um, that we still can learn so much from what happened. Um, I wanted to tell you the story of my family, one thing about my family, uh, that had to do with the, um, the loyalty questionnaire. Um, my dad was in Topaz also, because he was from Oakland. My grandfather uh, helped organize Wanto Gankuen, which was a Japanese language and cultural 
center in the community. And um, when they announced that they were, that people were gonna have to uh, fill out these loyalty questions, or the questionnaire, um, my father was, uh, so my dad was kind of brash and, and uh, didn't like to be told what to do. And he and his best friend decided that they were going to be among the first ones to, to go in and answer the questionnaire. And I think, I think it's because they knew that some of the Issei were going to set up chairs outside the barrack and see who went in to answer the questionnaire. And my grandfather wasn't among those Issei, but by the time my grandfather, my father got back to the barracks, my grandfather had heard and he chased him around the barrack with an ax. Um, and that, if you hear my father talk about it and, and he would say, I knew he wasn't gonna hurt me, that didn't bother me. And, but he finally left camp soon after that and my uncle said that he was kind of a wreck. Um, and it's just an example, it's just a, one example of how a family could be divided. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to share that. Um, I've known Karen ever since she started working at UC Santa Cruz campus. So that's decades. <laughs> and I have every book you've ever written on my special Asian Japanese American bookshelf. So I, 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 and I've, written, I've read all of them, so I, I have great admiration for you. Um, I'm also um, very proud of the fact that you took on this particular subject because those two questions that were asked of every Japanese American and Japanese national in camp became the dividing point among the Japanese Americans. Even today, over 60 years later, people are still considered an, uh, a descendant of the no-no boys or somebody who didn't. Mm -hmm. um, I'm currently the secretary treasurer of the National Japanese American Citizens League. Two years ago, this particular issue came up as an agenda item. The JACL organization um, they wanted them to apologize to the no-no boys and the descendants of the no-no boys, uh, primarily to try to increase their membership in the JACL. It turned out to be one of the most divisive discussions in the history of the JACL national organization. They, they argued about this thing for two days. Um, eventually, the apology was approved and accepted, but it was never made. It's still being... Uh, uh, considered a very divisive issue. Um, all of the people who were, had, had answered no, or just one no, or didn't answer at all, usually got sent to Thule Lake. So Thule Lake became the center of the no-no boys activity. And, I, and when I say boys, I'm sure there are women who answered no-no as well. But I think that women were smarter than the men. <laughs> so they, they could see that if they answered no-no, they couldn't stay in their other nine camps. They had to go to Thule Lake. So it, um, I'm just, I'm proud of the fact that you took on this particular subject, and especially proud of the fact that you call it by the two, the two questions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Um, I know your family was interned, and I'm curious, as you did these, this research into these questions, how did your family stories um, connect with the research that you were doing for these questions? Did you find any parallels? All right, so um, with my family, uh, on my father's side, there were seven, there were seven siblings. My, my grandfather was already dead. He died uh, during the Depression. And so my grandmother went with her seven children, and some of them were married by then. 
So the two oldest children were Kibei. They had been sent to Japan to be educated, and they were bilingual um, entirely, and they were educated both in Japan and the United States. Um, and then the other children were educated in the United States, right? So there were two Kibei children and then uh, six children. Um, and my mother, um, my mother graduated from Cal Berkeley in 1941, and that year, as you know, was the beginning of the war. And so, but my uncles could not finish college and they had to continue college after. So all, all of these things were moving along. And they, they, tried to, they came together in Oakland so that they could be interned together so they would all go to the same camp together. So they did that. Um, but really interesting is that the, the, the two oldest, um, uh, my, oldest, my uncle, who was Kibei, who was bilingual, he had the hardest time finally leaving camp because he was not trusted. And it's probably true. My, my cousin has looked into his paperwork, and um, he was unable to leave until the very end. And my, my, um, his wife and his children didn't leave until finally the end. They couldn't. Uh, but everyone else were given leave because they, they answered yes, yes, and they were able to get jobs. You had to get a job outside, outside of the West Coast. So my, my, um, my aunts went to Philadelphia, to New, uh, New York, uh, uh, St. Louis, Chicago. They were able to leave. Uh, but you had to say yes, yes on that, uh, that uh, um, uh, questionnaire. My mother, uh, when, when the, the discussion about the questionnaire came up, um, Apparently, my mother got up and told a group of people, I guess in their barracks, or, uh, and said, everyone has to decide for themselves. Because they were, people were being pressured to en masse um, answer no, no. And she felt that that was wrong, that everyone had to make up their own mind. So she got up and said that. Um, and um, she found out many years later that uh, because my, she had gotten up to say that in front of this crowd, that no one spoke to her mother again. So she went off and left camp. She worked in Minneapolis. Her sisters left. Everyone left. And uh, my, no one talked to my grandmother again in camp. Uh, she was entirely isolated from. So she would go. She, yeah. It, so those are things that have gone on. Um, and I realized when my father came out of camp and he went, he was one of the first people to come back to Oakland, to California, and he opened up a church. And in the church were all the people's belongings. And so he was asked to come back to open a hostel, uh, to clear that out, to get people's things back to them, but also to have cots so that they could come and stay uh, as they came back from camp and into Oakland. Um, and my father, my, my sister said something the one that he was shot at, and I had never heard that story. But he never talked about it. Um, and he always wanted to uh, put all of these, all this story past, uh, and to put the future in another light. Um, because he had to take care of these people as they came uh, back from camp and house them. And uh, he saw the sadness of people and their anger. Uh, and uh, I think as a consequence, he was, he was a very jovial person, you know? So jovial despite. And I, I didn't understand that about my dad. Um, and also, one other thing, I think many, many Sansei remember this story. It's like we don't, our parents no, never necessarily talked about the camps. 
And we found out many, you'll talk to Sansei and they'll say, they found out very late, like in high school or something, they read something and they came home and said, did this really happen? Because our, our parents were always getting together and they would meet people and they would always say, what camp were you in? And my sister and I thought that they went to camp. <laughs> and we all thought, well, why couldn't we go to camp? And we don't get friends that way. It's like, well, it was very strange. And it, it took a while until, to, until we really could hear the stories, but also read the history. Thank you, Karen. It's great to, to, be, uh, to be able to be back in Santa Cruz and hear you talk as one of the former um, student and uh, UCSC alum alumnus. It's quite a pri privilege and, and, and excitement. Um, I, I just want to offer one question and one, one quick thought, which is um, the relevance of the two questions, which are still, I think, uh, highly relevant uh, today. Uh, coming from Taiwan, uh, that's one of the uh, other burning issues that we're dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, not in the same way as the incarceration of the of the internment, but uh, it, but you know, uh, in in a very uh, different context, but in a very similar uh, problem. W w um, what I got really interested in, in both you know in this talk and also in the, in letter to my memory uh, is that attention to the uh, first generation, um, and it seems to me that at least in terms of Japanese American uh, historiography, the first generation uh, were the generation that had nothing, have very little left except the memories that you have. So I wonder, um, you know, if you may talk about the, the sort of um, significance or relevance of the first generation um, to the present. I mean, why this turn to the first generation? Um, perhaps you may have some memories of them or perhaps you, they didn't tell you much about what went on um, and how this, you know, history or memory get mediated in different generations, uh, pass, passing on to the next. Um, just wonder if you have any thoughts on, you know, what would be the difference between, you know, hearing the story from your parents versus hearing them from your grandparents if, if you did. Yeah, thank you. Um, what to, what this, that's a big question. It's huge. Uh, one of the things that I was really interested in was thinking about uh, the first settlers, the first, yeah, first Issei who came, and what they experienced and what they did, and how they set, set, um, set up their idea of the future and what they would be doing. Okay, so. I, I was really interested in seeing these folks who came out of the Meiji era, a particular era of change, radical change in Japan. So I wanted to also think about what was happening in Japan and, and how, how these people were leaving. Um, and then also their belief systems. Okay, so what did they bring over? And then um, if, they were, if they were from what class family? The farmers who came, the people who were merchants, and also uh, the samurai or the warrior class, and their, the differences as they, as they move over and create community. Um, and um, I, I, I want to take a look at uh, the hierarchy in, this, um, in these communities. Who, owns the news, who owned the newspapers? Who had the? Uh, who were able to speak to the community uh, and organize the community? What they were saying to uh, Japanese and what they thought the future would be based on what the politics were in Japan. Also, their um, their their uh, you know their commitment to uh, new ideas, uh, but also. Uh, uh, I you know, my mind is not here. I can't hardly talk. Um, uh, you know, for, for example, they became Christians, and they started Christian churches, and they used the churches as organizations uh, for uh, extending their, their um, community. 
but also their idea of what the f future would be in the United States. And, uh, but at every, every, every year, they, they worked on something. Something would happen. There would be a policy or a government policy, so there would be alien land law, or there would be the gentleman's agreement, or something would be there so that it would cut away their ability to have a life in the United States, right? Um, uh, and, and by the 1920s, they, they couldn't, the labor couldn't come in, you couldn't have picture, you know, you could marry, but you could have a picture bride, but you had to have money. Uh, you couldn't buy land or own it. Uh, you couldn't have it, later they want, you couldn't have it in your, your children's names. And all, at every, every step, uh, they lost their opportunities until the war came. Um, and the, the government in, the, in Japan was also aware of this. And they were also using it as a political mm, back and forth uh, to say, you're treating our people this way, so uh, you know, you know, we, we, we don't agree with this. And they couldn't, they couldn't resolve this. And then, uh, yeah, and then the war happened by then. And, and Japan was really squeezed by then. Uh, so the Japanese in, in, who had come here, some of them come to, came to immigrate and to, to be free uh, and embrace their American status. Uh, but I think many people thought that they would, uh, that the Nisei, the second generation, would be this bridge back and forth. And that's why they sent their children back to be educated. They thought maybe they would return and make their, their uh, money in the United States and return to get land in, um, in Japan. Or that they, th they would have a, a life in two places. Um, and certainly there was a coloni uh, colonizing aspect to all of this. Uh, uh, they were colonizers. Uh, and, they, and I know this because I studied the Japanese in Brazil. They created colonies in Brazil and in Mexico and here in this country. Um, but in this country, you, that's, you know, we don't say that, <laughs> right? But, yeah. But in this country, you couldn't buy land anyway. And so the early, early Japanese who were able to buy land and sell land to uh, settlers, they had uh, a better start. But they bought the, the, the cheapest, most crummy, horrible land. And it's amazing the Japanese were, turned it into some place that was arable, and they were able to turn it into farmland. And then, of course, California. Uh, people were really jealous, and they um, made it impossible for the Japanese to have a living and, uh, yeah. So then the war came. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're hungry. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I think we should give Karen a rest at this point. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Um, there are refreshments, I believe, um, over in the side, and I'm sure Karen would be happy to talk to people individually as well. So thank you so much. That was such a wonderful talk. Um, <laughs>